All right. Hello, everybody. How you guys doing? Welcome to today's Road Reflection. I hope everybody is having a wonderful Tuesday morning, uh, Tuesday evening, afternoon, uh, or not even a Tuesday. I don't. I don't know when you're gonna watch this video. It it, it might not even be on a, a, a on the day that it's uh, recorded. You know. I'm just I'm making I'm making an assumption, and I shouldn't do that. <laughs> Uh, how's it going, everybody? I hope you guys are having uh, a, a good day, whatever day uh, it is, whatever day has uh, led you to find this video. Uh, and uh, and if you if you are someone new to this video, I hope you uh, I hope you enjoy it, and and I hope you uh, click that subscribe button, click that like button, uh, share it amongst amongst your friends, amongst your enemies, amongst whoever you feel uh, needs something like this uh, today. I am doing all right um, to do my check-in at the top of the show. I'm doing okay. Um, got a pretty good show, I think. I'm, I'm excited to talk about some of this stuff. Um, we are going to continue down uh, learning about some strikes that are important and what we can take away from some of these strikes. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, some encryption issues, some food issues. Uh, hopefully it won't get as <laughs> uh, direly serious as, as yesterday's show was. Yesterday's show, I feel like, was uh, really, it, got, it ended up getting kind of intense. <clears throat> A lot of intense things to talk about. But uh, I'm doing all right. Um, I'm a little I'm a little sore. I went on a a, a pretty brisk walk uh, yesterday, and uh, I'm I'm gonna take my car down to the shop today uh, to to get the uh, inspection and all that sort of stuff taken care of. Um, that's one of the things that I really like. I feel like I don't um, I don't have a lot of possessions. Um, like I get. Like, a lot of people have, like, clothing and stuff that they kind of get attached to. And I, and I have some. I have some, some articles of clothing um, that, I, that I'm particularly fond of. You know, uh, uh, some vests, some blazers that I like. Uh, but, you know, when it's, when it's time, to, time for them to go, it's time for them to go. And <laughs> I, don't, I don't really end up getting attached to that sort of stuff all, all, all that often. And even if I do, I have a... Uh, my personal view is that I I end up having a little bit of an easier time letting go of, of things like clothing or little chutch keys here and there, you know, uh, that sort of stuff. Uh, I I have a, uh, an easier time letting go of, but but there are certain things that I think have uh, clear utilitarian values to me. You know, like my computer, my hard drives, my phone. Uh, my car, those are all things that have been very important because they, uh, they're things that I need to do my job, <laughs> for one, right? Um, but they also kind of have this, like, uh, this meaning of independence behind them. Um, I talked about how my first car kind of had, uh, had that meaning behind it where the, the reason why that car was so important to me was because of, um, you know, because it, it represented my independence, that I could go where I felt like I needed to go. I could take the, the drives that I've always felt like um, have have been soothing to me, have been calming to me. I've, I've always enjoyed uh, taking drives and listening to music. My friends and I used to do that in high school and college all the time. That was actually a way that I would decompress and, and you know, like, I'm a very thinky kind of person, so uh, uh, it gives me a time to, like, evaluate my thoughts, evaluate the state that I'm in and, and kind of, uh, find my center, uh, find my balance and, and, you know, uh, discover something about myself and go through and be like, aha, this is why I feel about, feel this particular way about this particular event. Oh, that's why I kind of got upset that this person said this thing to me, um, in this manner or what have you. <clears throat> it's, it's this point of introspection. Um, plus, you know, I like, I like, uh, yelling and singing in my car. That's, 
that's what I do. I, I got I got a list of uh, music that I like to go to. I got I got a bunch of like political rap that I listen to. I listen to like old school stuff, and uh, I got and then I got a bunch of sad boy rock. That's what I like to call it, sad boy rock. So amidst Doom Tree and Astronautilus and Rage Against the Machine and the Foo Fighters, I still got Taken Back Sunday and Coheed and Cambria and Brand New and all this other shit that I used to listen to <clears throat> way back, way back in the day. Um, so, I, I, you know, taking care of my car is, is, is important. So I'm going to do the inspection today. Hopefully everything goes well with it. Um, this is, I mean, this is, it's a generally pretty new car, but you never, I, I always get nervous. You know, that's just is something that, when it comes down to dealing with cars, even when I'm taking it in for like a routine oil, um, oil change and whatnot, I, I still get, I'm still like, oh shit, don't fucking tell me something is more than I need to do, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so I always, I always kind of get a little, a little nervous, a little jumpy around that sort of stuff. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, <coughs> oh, excuse me. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm sorry if that was very loud. I saw the I saw the audio meter go to the red line, um, but um, other than that, I mean, today I'm I'm staying. I'm trying to stay focused on uh, tasks at hand and uh, not getting too distracted. I think that's been part of the problem with me as of late. Um, has been uh, my energy has been directed at at, at multiple different things at each moment so <clears throat> excuse me um part of the part of the thing is like when i'm trying to write i'm also thinking about tomorrow's video and when i'm doing tomorrow's video i'm also thinking about how to do the podcast or is there a drawing i could do or a laundry i need to take care of. so i'm i'm you know getting back to the practice of and part of, I, I think part of that is um how my probably the anxiety of the situation has manifested itself is uh kind of the scatter shot so it it's very draining and it and it you know takes my energy down pretty 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 decently so so you know like that's that's part of the reason why i think i've i've been getting more tired i haven't been as productive as i would like to be and i've been moving a lot slower in terms of producing the content that i would like to produce in terms of writing the things that i would like uh, to write, um, it, it, part of part of it is 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 just the the way I'm I'm kind of um, dispersing my energy. I'm not I'm not focused enough on the thing that I need to do on the task that needs to be done. You know, even when I'm even when I'm doing uh, like when I'm exercising or going on those walks, the problem that I was having over the last you know maybe week and a half, two weeks or so. Uh, was that my mind was preoccupied with other things. I wasn't really just concentrating on uh, on enjoying the walk or enjoying the workout um, as I normally would. You know, normally when I go on these walks and when I'm, when I'm in the gym, when I'm doing my exercises throughout the day, that's the thing that I'm focused on. When I'm writing, that's, and that hasn't been the case um, as of, uh, as of late. So I'm, I'm doing, I'm, uh, you know, kind of getting my mind back into, uh, into focusing on, particular things um you know what 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 is the task at hand that is the task at hand um you know uh, if someone texts me if someone messages me if someone emails me i don't need to immediately jump and uh respond to it i can i can take a little bit of time to they'll understand because they will uh if i tell them hey i'm sorry i didn't get to this message or email or whatever i've been doing this thing i think they'll i think they'll get it So um, I'm I'm trying to get get that discipline, get that focus back. Uh, it'll be a process. It'll be a journey, and it, and and I'm I'm hoping I can get there. I'm hoping I can get back to <laughs> uh, having the level of energy that I normally would have, um, you know, throughout the day. Um, and uh, and again, I, I it, in the in the evening time, I've been I've been wearing these. I've been wearing my prescription sunglasses. Uh, just to decrease the amount of strain on my eyes from being stuck on a screen, uh, which I feel like I'm, I'm, it's amplified now um, because normally it's administrative stuff during the day, creative stuff in the evening time, and then at night, um, you know, beyond the 7 p.m. or the 8 p.m., 
I'm either going out to see my friends or to the gym or taking care of things around the house or reading a book or doing, you know, the, or I'm at a show or whatever. I'm not staring directly at a screen, but, but right now I think my screen time has uh, increased quite a bit. So I got I to gotta do that to kind of bring my eyes, um, you know, not, not overstrain my eyes as much as, uh, as much as I think it would. Uh, so, um, with, with that check-in in place, uh, I'm doing well. I hope you guys are doing well. Um, you know, when, whenever I'm rambling through my little check-in, if you guys leave comments below, I'm here to check them out. Um, you know, this is a pre-recorded video, but, but I'm in the chats. I'm paying attention to what you guys are saying in regards to this stuff. So if you guys have a little check-in for yourselves that you want to throw into the comments, um, feel, feel free to do though, do, do that. And, you know, we're, we're all here to kind of respond and, uh, and be encouraging and, uh, and, and be, and be a positive force for everybody, uh, through, through, uh, this trying time, uh, because th there's a lot of negativity happening, um, you know, on, on, on this global pandemic front, but, but we can be the positive light, uh, to help each other out and get each other through the days. Uh, so with that said, let us move to the first uh, story. Let's talk about the 1835 Philadelphia general strike. Um, so uh, I mentioned when I did the 1919 Seattle general strike uh, that that was the first time something like that had ever been seen. And I... And I'll clear that up, in in because you're you're looking at it going. Wait a minute, Chris. You talked about the 1919 Seattle general strike being the first time a general strike had ever been seen, and and to that degree, I think that was true. I I kind of had to reevaluate because that's a lot of the information that I was reading at the time was saying that the 1919 Seattle general strike was the first um, general strike that America had ever seen, and I think they're right in that it shut down the entire city of Seattle. Um, that was the first time that a general strike had brought everything to like a total halt, right? Like there was nobody out um, in the streets. The the only thing you could hear was the tide coming in and out. Everybody was kind of at home with their families, um, and then it and then because it because it had escalated to that level, um, the strikers themselves, the labor organizers themselves, um, decided to organize even further and create a community initiatives to take care of the people that you know, might not have food or need milk delivered or garbage taken out. So, so the community came together um, and took care of those things, which is when, you know, uh, as sort of another r recap of, of that general strike is uh, that's whenever things, that's whenever the propaganda was, came in, that's when people started getting arrested just for, just for literally helping people take out their trash, just for literally feeding people. Um, this is sort of what the establishment does. This is sort of what the status quo that people crave so much does is that if, if any sort of um, any sort of real humanitarian cause that isn't approved or dictated by the government itself is is an arrestable offense. That's that's the society we live. That's status quo. That's what everybody is 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 clamoring for. That is. A, a different form of just authoritarianism. So um, the Philadelphia general strike, the 1835 Philadelphia general strike is a little bit different than that. Um, so let's go through it. So this really starts in the 1820s, 1820s and, you know, into the 1830s. Um, they, there were some strikes at that point. And uh, uh, what, what, the, what the strikes were really about at that point was to reduce the workday down to 10 hours. That's what it was about. Um, 600 carpenters in Philly, 600 carpenters in Boston, um, they all came together and they, uh, they ran a strike and uh, it failed. Um, they didn't get what they wanted. They were disbanded. Um, I'm assuming cops were called. That's usually how this sort of stuff works. If, if, if we've seen the pattern, uh, in these strikes, like the MLB strikes didn't have the authorities called on them, right? Like that, that one, um, the, the 1972 and 1994, it's like whenever, whenever the upper kind of the, the lower upper class strikes against the upper upper class, um, you know, the, the authorities aren't called, the military isn't used against them. Like 
like the the army wasn't called in to like blow up a fucking baseball stadium uh a ballpark to to like show these baseball strikers who's boss usually for this when it's blue collar workers when it's white collar workers when when people from different um jobs are coming together uh that's whenever the cops you know and and tanks are set up and it's like we got machine guns we're gonna use the machine guns uh because these people like human rights are dangerous okay human rights could lead to less profits for us and that's scary that's scary so we have to kill these people like that's the way that it works <laughs> so um they had a couple of these strikes the strikes didn't didn't work they didn't get the 10 hour work day they were disbanded um so in 1835 the boston carpenters decided to go on a strike all together right the carpenters in boston went to go on strike and they uh, penned a piece for the boston circular which was a pretty big paper at the time the Boston Circular was a pretty, pretty big paper. A lot of people read it. It was a pretty important paper at the time too. Um, so uh, they basically penned a letter uh, talking about uh, what what they wanted, right? And and here's here's one of the things. I hope you guys can read this. Here here's one of the things that uh, uh, the the strike leaders said. Uh, he said we have been too long subjected to the odious cruel, unjust, and tyrannical system which compels the operative mechanic to exhaust his physical and mental powers. We have rights and duties to perform as American citizens and members of society which forbid us to dispose more than 10 hours for a day's work. Now, <clears throat> you can make that claim for today as well. Uh, we have an eight-hour workday rule and let's say that you are an employer of some kind um and you know the the, the way that they've been getting around that is through part-time work uh part-time workers only can work maybe six hours but in order to be, but because you're part-time doesn't mean that you are uh subject to terrible like worse and worse condi work conditions but and that's part of the thing right is because if you're part-time and you only work six hours for less pay than what you would work at eight hours at full-time um, and get benefits and all that sort of stuff, you have to get two or three other jobs, which means that you are working well past 10 hours a day. You might be working 14 hours a day um, and only getting 10 hours to sleep and eat and have, have recreational time and all this other stuff, uh, right? That's, that's what's going on today. And in 1835, they were basically saying 10 hours is basically what you can do right because because what what uh this cat seth luther is talking about um is talking about physical and mental powers being exhausted and think of the worker today how many of us work two three jobs how many of us work even just one job that's far more demanding right teachers teachers work one job but i know a lot of teachers that have to take their work home with them and continue doing their work at home Right. That's kind of like I, I think that's what homework really teaches you is is homework teaches you that when you get home, you don't stop the job. You're off the clock. You're not getting paid for that labor, but you still have to get it done. Right. It teaches you like that's what ed the education system really teaches you. It teaches you how to be a good little worker bee, just buzzing around, making somebody else money. That's kind of what it teaches you to be. Um, and, you know, and I, and I do feel like worker B might be an inaccurate uh, way to describe that because here's the thing. A worker B serves a function um, and it, and isn't isn't worked to death. Like, I'm pretty sure, like, bees are like, You've, you're good. We got a different shift coming in. Just fucking chill out for a bit, you know, like move, I don't know, lick some honey or something. I don't, I don't, I don't, do a dance. Go Go visit that flower you like. Just go hang out. You're fine. You know, so maybe that's not the most accurate way, but but it's but that's kind of what it is. You you're supposed to take your work home with you, um, and do that work and get it completed off the clock, um, instead of instead of kind of having a more relaxed attitude towards that work, and saying, um, hey, why don't we why don't we give teachers an opportunity to take an hour and a half or two hours of the day within this within within the parameters of school itself 
where they can do all their grading. They can do extra lesson planning. You know, I know they get free periods and things of that sort, but but that still isn't enough if they're taking that work home and they're, they continue, they, they continue, they have to continue to keep doing that. And I know tons of other people that have to do that, right? It's just not teachers. I'm using teachers as an example. Um, I'm sure, I'm sure some of you guys out there have jobs where you've had to take that job, uh, home and have done it from home. Um, and you know, like when you break it down, it doesn't really add up. So that's what these guys are fighting for. Uh, so they penned this letter. They talked about, you know, the physical exhaustion, the mental exhaustion, um, and then they organized a traveling committee to request the assistance of other cities. They basically were, were getting people together and sending them out to organize a, a strike of the same nature in other cities and saying, come join us in solidarity uh, in Boston. The, join, join the Boston Carpenters and, and have solidarity between us. <clears throat> Now, this did fail. Um, the Boston strike did not pan out. Once again, they were disbanded. I'm sure police force was used. Uh, there's very little detail in regards to that, in regards to how this stuff was uh, disbanded, but, it, but they were disbanded nonetheless, right? But um, it, because they had these organizing tr uh travel committees that they had put together in Philadelphia, there were a bunch of carpenters that were like, hey, those Boston cats, fucking, they got a point. We got, we should do this. And uh, the, the, the guy that, the, uh, that started with the carpenters in Philadelphia um, and the guy that was in charge of, uh, of, of the, the, basically the carpenter union at the time, right? He said that the Boston strike the Boston strike showed them uh, that they can they can break their shackles, loosen their chains, and made them free from the galling yoke of excessive labor. That fucking language is amazing, isn't it? That language is so good. Oh, that's some fucking fighting language right there. You know, that's a, that's like that's the kind of poetry that when when you hear it, you're like, yeah, man, yeah, let's fucking let's fucking change the system. You know, like. That language is, is poetic, it's beautiful, it encapsulates so much, you know. And this is the sort of shit <laughs> that when you read this sort of shit, you're like, oh my god, I'm so, I'm like, I'm ready to fucking do this. I'm ready to rock and roll right now, you know. I'm ready to take to the streets, damn it. You know, it's like, Chris, where's the fucking organization happening? Where is it? Is it happening now? Let's do this. <laughs> like, I read that this morning and I was just like, fuck yeah, man. Broke the bro, broke their shackles, loosened their chains, and made them free from the galling yokes of excessive labor. Fuck, I don't even know what a galling yoke is, but I, but I don't think it's good. You know, I think we need to be free from these galling yokes. Fuck these yokes, you know. But and it empowered a bunch of people, <laughs> even in 1835. You know. Uh, so 300 workers, specifically that worked in the coal industry, <clears throat> marched down the Schuylkill River coal wharf, led by a worker who had a sword. That's right, this motherfucker rode down the Schuylkill River with a sword, <laughs> right? Just like bearing a sword, it's <laughs> ready to go. Uh, and then he threatened death on anyone that crossed the picket line. So if the bosses decided that they were going to get some scabs to come in to do the job, to to go work at the coal yard, well, that's not going to happen because this motherfucker with a sword is is going to it, it mince you up, is going to dice you up, right? That's like, which is part of the thing that leads me to believe um, that there was violence used in the in the eighteen twenties, and then in that even in that uh, eighteen thirty five Boston strike. Um, it leads me to believe that there was probably some sort of violence used uh, because this motherfucker, like people don't just, I, I, I don't believe that. That's not the pattern of human behavior that you just arbitrarily choose violence. It is the pattern of behavior um, when someone is uh, trying to protect or masquerade their guilt 
is trying to use fear as a motive. As, as we've seen in virtually all these strikes, the bosses, the people at the top are scared. They're scared that they're going to lose money, they're going to lose investment, they're going to lose power. The power will go to the worker. The worker will be, you know, they'll democratize the workplace. And by democratizing the workplace, um, they make more money. They have more reason to actually do it. They feel more fulfilled at their job. They feel like they're serving a bigger purpose, which means that they will realize that these bosses uh, don't actually have much of a purpose. So they use that fear, that, it, that internalized fear, and then push it outward, which is where you see you know, violent threats, which is where you see them calling for the army to come in and, and calling for police brutality. Even back in the 1800s, they were doing it. So I think this is sort of a protective measure to be like, we've seen these motherfuckers use violence before, so we're going to have a sword, and I'm going to fucking be like, you want to cross this picket line? Do you? Huh? I'm using a pen because it's technically stronger than a sword. Now, <laughs> that was just the coal, coal wharf workers, 300 of them, right? But they were like immediately after that joined by the leather dressers, printers, more carpenters, bricklayers, masons, house painters, bakers, and then city employees were joining them too. Um, and then on June 6th, 1835, there was a mass movement, mass movement of workers from all over the city, the entire city, um, and they organized together and they made a list of demands. So what was their list of demands? 10-hour workday. That's what we've been talking about this whole time, uh, right? 10-hour workday. Uh, better pay for everybody. Pay wage increases for everybody, including the women workers. They were, they, were, they were like talking about women's rights in 1835 because of this labor union, because of this labor strike, right? Boycotts of any boss who makes anybody work more than 10 hours so if so at this point you also have to remember um overtime pay is like not a thing they that that comes in almost almost 100 years later i'm sorry rather a little over 100 years later 1938 is when they when they uh put, officially put overtime pay into play right so almost 100 years later they come into it um and uh and you know they're talking about getting better pay for women and they're talking about boycotting anybody that that makes people work longer than 10 hours basically saying we will we will re-engage all of this shit if you think you can just kind of say the words without seeing any sort of punishment behind it you got another thing coming okay you know that motherfucker with a sword we got 10 motherfuckers with the sword and we got 20 with a fucking pen that are going to write you out. <laughs> We're going to write you out of history, motherfucker. <laughs> so, um, that was on June 6th. Uh, by the end of this, by the end of the strike, uh, which only ended after city city and public works employees joined the ranks of the uh, of the 20,000 people in Philadelphia that had already uh, risen to the strike, the government caved. The city government finally was just like, okay, we've had enough, okay? I've been trying to make coffee by myself and I almost set the building on fire. I don't know what I'm doing. What pans am I supposed to use? I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And they caved, right? And on June 21st, 1835, a 10-hour workday was Im implemented citywide. The entire city was 10-hour workdays. You can't go beyond 10 hours. They got their wage increases, in including for women, um, and, and they said that you can't go beyond this 10-hour fucking workday. You just can't do it, right? So obviously a lot of the bosses were pissed off at this, but, but what were they going to do? You, you, got, you got motherfuckers with a pen writing them out of history, and you got motherfuckers with a sword uh, carving them you know, in, into history. But, and here's, here's sort of the, the amazing part about this victory, right? He, here's the thing. Um, this news spread all across the country. Like, the fact that the Philadelphia general strike worked, um, it didn't shut the city down like the 1919 Seattle general strike did. It didn't shut down the whole city or anything. But it worked still, right? Um, this, it's, we saw this go all across the country. 
And then people were like, wait a minute, we can win? We can win? So New Jersey did it. That's right, fucking New Jersey did it, you guys. Like, if fucking New Jersey can make it happen, I'm pretty sure everybody can make it happen. Uh, Massachusetts, North Carolina, Connecticut, and by the end of 1835, the entire country, the entire country uh, in 1835 had a 10-hour workday. And, uh, and that's huge. That's huge, right? It's ironic to me that uh, th- the victors are the ones that write the history. We've, we've all heard this adage before, uh, that the victors are the ones that write the history. But we won right here. Why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we talking about the 1835 Philadelphia general strike that led to a countrywide shift in the labor movement? Why, aren't, what, why, why hasn't that been written into the history books? You know, um, we don't learn about this shit in school. We don't learn about this shit as part of our public education program. And that's, and that's done on purpose because they don't want you to organize. They want you to go home and do your homework find that answer that they told you to find, they told you was the right answer, and then recite it to us. Because what they want is good little workers. They want these drones that aren't going to question the authority, that aren't going to question the bosses, that aren't going to question city officials. They want, they want to hide this sort of information so that you don't, you don't realize that you can actually win. And how do we win? We win by staying in solidarity with each other. That's how we win. This is not only about, um, what, like, it, it wasn't only about the carpenters in Boston. It was about everybody. That's why they got the community together. And that, that might be something that we might have to put into effect at some point soon, is if we want a nationwide general strike, something that I, I don't think we've genuinely seen, like, a nationwide general strike before. If we really want to see something like that, we might have to, um, we might, first of all, have to, implement this idea on two levels and go with me here because this is coming to me as like my brain is operating in the moment. So you're seeing the, the gears turn in my head. Um, first of all, it's going to take someone, you know, so we, we're seeing Amazon strikes, Whole Foods strikes, McDonald's, Pittsburgh sanitation. We might see a healthcare strike. I'm not sure, but we're going to see strikes popping up all over the damn place. And, uh, and what it might be is to go to, you know, Walmart or Target or, uh, it, you know, send a couple people to be like, hey, you guys should ask for better hazard pay. You guys should ask for better safety equipment, you know. And when that happens, um, the Target strike is in solidarity with the Amazon strike. Now you have something going within the city itself, right? The community, those, those uh, what do they call it? Community or uh, that organized traveling committee, the organized traveling committee, um, you do that on a local level, on a citywide level. So each city kind of can do that on its own. And then the second level is, let's say, you know, you hear like, uh, Dothan, Alabama is not, uh, it, you know, the, the strikes aren't really moving in Dothan, Alabama. Now you can send that organizing committee over and be like, here's what we learned in Pittsburgh. Here's what we learned from you know uh rochester here here, here's what we learned in poughkeepsie uh, and put all that information and help dothan alabama bring that general strike to the forefront so i think that organizing traveling committee idea can really work on two different levels that would be that in my opinion would be quite successful i might be wrong i don't know and then we write that history we write the history of how we came together and fucking teach it to other kids we teach it to the next generation so that if if the powers that be, if at any point, if any sort of power that be decides that they're going to try to exploit people, decides that that's their point of intelligence, is exploiting the shit out of people and making money off of them and not giving, not giving them the basic human rights that they deserve, then we have, we have it right there in our history. We fucking use these. We fucking use this to, to show people how to win. <clears throat> They learn from it. <clears throat> Excuse me, guys. My throat's really dry today. Um, but, they, but they learn from it, right? The establishment, the, 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 the bosses, uh, as you would. That's what we saw in 1919. If you go back and watch that video, you can pick up the little details of how they 
paid attention to how um, these organizers came together and, and made a change for the betterment of the worker, that, that made a change to democratize the workplace a little bit more. <clears throat> and through that, they, you know, in, in 1919 in Seattle, they used, um, they, used, they used morale as a way to kind of put an end to the strike. And then eventually we countered that and said, no, you know what? Our morale isn't going to go down because this is more than just about the labor leaders. This is just this is more than about the union leaders. Um, this is about the community. So in Winnipeg, when it happened, they didn't go down. Um, and then they resorted to violence and then that ended the strike. Well, in San Francisco in 1934, that did not play out. Right. A hundred years later, the bigger tactics of um, the diminishing morale and using violence against strikers didn't work out. And, uh, and the 1934 San Francisco general strike was just as much a success as the 1835 Philadelphia general strike. Uh, because we learned. We learned what, what, what their tactics are. We learned what they're trying to do with it. Um, and, and by staying together, by being in solidarity with each other, we were able to win. And that's our key. Our key is that we don't let the violence, um, we don't let the violence discourage us. We don't let a couple people getting arrested, uh, or the, the labor leaders getting arrested discourage us. We don't let Bernie Sanders not fucking being uh, on the offense towards fucking Joe Biden and, the, and, and all these establishment Democrats discourage us from pushing the movement forward and doing what needs to be done to get our rights back. That's what movements like this really show us. So, uh, <laughs> hope, uh, let's move to our, our second story. Um, and I think this story is going to be uh, pretty darn important to a lot of us, especially, especially folks if you have kids, because we're going to talk about uh, Zoom <clears throat> and their major encryption crisis that they have, because they do. They have they have a little bit of an, a, an encryption crisis going on. Um, for those of you that might not know what Zoom is, it's a uh, online meeting program uh, where you can like set up a meeting. You can put in passwords to make sure that it's protected and all that sort of stuff but that's how a lot of people are are communicating right now a lot of people are working from home there's a lot of kids at home that that you know require some extra attention uh beyond just from a parent so uh, educators and uh businesses and so on and so forth have been using zoom as a way to meet with their employees to meet with their uh with their students and so on and so forth and uh and and hold classes even right some some people are holding classes via zoom um, which is very cool. And uh, what's what's happening? One of the one of the problems with it is this thing called Zoom bombing. Um, I had no idea about any of this stuff. I had no idea that that this this was even fucking happening, right? Um, I talked to Ron Placone um, maybe a week week and a half ago or something like that. That's when uh, Ron and Graham did their first uh, Zoom show that they're doing, uh, which if you guys haven't seen uh, Ron Placone or, or Graham Elwood, highly recommend checking them out. Very funny cats. Um, uh, Ron has an album called Agnostic Holiday that's available uh, on all of the platforms that you, you want to use. Um, and uh, I know Graham has some albums as well. I've known Ron for like a decade. Um, but... Um, what was I going to say? Oh, so they do shows via Zoom, and I, I was talking to them, you know, just to be like, hey, what do you what do you recommend here? What do you do you have uh, do you have a recommendation? And you know, and then uh, I, I've been thinking about running a show via Zoom, right? Like a stand up comedy esque show via Zoom. I haven't fully figured out exactly what that needs to be because um, I am trying to take it one thing at a time and, and putting my attention you know, um, and, and trying to focus on, on the, the, the particular task at hand in the moment. Um, so I, I need to, you know, dedicate some time to formatting a show and coming up with a test show and then getting some feedback and then <clears throat> reformatting and then doing the real thing. But somebody pointed out, hey, if you do that, be careful um, because there, there's this thing called Zoom bombing going on 
in in our society now within within fucking what four weeks of of of, of us you know using this stuff we're we're doing zoom bombing which if you don't know what that is i had to look it up too um it's basically trolls that end up coming into like public zoom meetings and in cases of like the classroom um they just use a bunch of profanity there's uh cases where they've doxed the teacher um there's neo-nazis coming in and displaying swastikas and shit shit like that uh you know just awful shit um and these are all public meetings by the way right these are uh they just set up the meeting and they put the link out and anybody that has the link can immediately join uh, the meeting itself. The way you get around that is password protected. Uh, don't do any public meetings. And, uh, you know, so it is it is a little bit extra work that needs to be done, but it's a little bit extra work that I think goes uh, a long way. So I, I still think that I'm going to probably end up using Zoom um, because it's such a uh, universally used platform right now. Um, to try to do the comedy show and try to learn that platform a little bit more. Like the pre-recorded videos here, I'm using OBS and I still have to learn a shit ton of stuff about OBS in and of itself. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not fully versed on it yet. I've got a couple things down, a couple other things I need to learn. But, you know, it's a focus, focusing on one thing at a time is sort of the thing. So, uh, but password protected. So if you're a parent out there, if you're if if you're someone that does public classes, um, if you teach um, singing lessons, or if you uh, you know are are getting a meeting together, if you're trying to get a discussion group together, if you're just hanging out with your friends via Zoom, uh, please 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 password protect that shit. Put a password on it, and send all of those details. Uh, you know, to your buddies over email or something along those lines, some other encrypted form, uh, because Zoom is having a, some issues with their in, with their encryption. <clears throat> but here's the dip: uh, the FBI has actually deemed Zoom to be a federal crime. Is that crazy? Like this is a federal crime now. <laughs> uh, they basically say. The FBI has said, password protect your meetings. Don't make it public. Uh, but if somebody does, ha you know, Zoom bomb you or whatever, report that shit. Report that shit. And I totally get it. I totally get it. Right? 100%. I 100% get it. Um, but... I kind of feel like uh, reporting the stuff to the FBI might not be the best idea. And I'll tell you why. Um, Zoom does not have end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, what they have is the same level of encryption that you see on a website uh, to protect it. So when you go on any website, what, it, what data and information that it collects is your IP address so they know where you know you're you're coming from where 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 the traffic is coming from um, as well as you know what operating system you're using and so so that way if there's like let's say you're using a Mac and you're using Opera um, and you go to the intercept and the intercept website's not working and you report a problem they can say oh it's a, it seems like Opera is not linking with this code and they can adjust it and fix it and so on and so forth right but um, what they said was they had end-to-end -end encryption. That means that both ends of the meeting themselves are encrypted um, and protected. Uh, and that's not the case because, it, because it's, they're, they're just not. The, they get an access key is essentially what you get. You get one encryption key for both ends and you share that encryption key. That's, that's sort of the way that it works. But they said they had end-to-end -end encryption. And the reason why you want to have end-to-end -end encryption is particularly because um, with end-to-end, -end, Zoom can't grab any of the data that you transfer within a Zoom meeting itself, right? So let's say you're passing files 
from from one to another on a Zoom meeting so everybody can kind of see what this file is all about. Well, without this end-to-end -end encryption, Zoom has that file now. They have that file. So even teachers, like let's say the teachers are passing a file to a child or something like that. Like that now now it's in that. Like Zoom has access to that. Um, so it's just it's not it's not as safe. It's and you know and and it's one of those things. It's like it's a matter of privacy, really. You know, it's a matter of data collection. Um, sure, you can collect the data for you know the IP address and your make and model and what's what internet thing you're whatever. That's fine. That's I think kind of standard. But the rest of it, you know, that's whenever it starts getting really invasive of your own privacy. And that's where this FBI stuff comes into play. And it makes it a little bit more tricky. Because now the FBI, if they have to investigate the Zoom bombing stuff, basically break that privacy. And they get to look into all of your Zoom meetings. They get to look into who was there and the connected Zoom. You see what I'm saying? Like it becomes this domino effect. Um, so if they don't have end-to-end -end encryption, how does Zoom actually work, right? Why is this sort of um, an issue of privacy? So here, here's what they've said. This is from The Intercept. Uh, this is what they said uh, is the way that Zoom works. When you start a Zoom meeting, the Zoom software running your device fetches a key in which to encrypt audio and video. This key comes from the Zoom's cloud infrastructure, which contains servers uh, around the world. Specifically, it comes from a type of server known as a key management system, which generates encryption keys and distributes them to meeting participants. Each user gets the same shared key as they join a meeting. It's transmitted to Zoom software on their devices from the key management system using yet another encryption system called the TLS, the same technology that's used on the HTTPS protocol that protects websites. Uh, depending on how this meeting is set up, some, Zooms, some servers in Zoom's cloud, uh, cl Zoom's cloud called connectors may also get a copy of this key. For example, if someone uh, calls in on the phone, they're actually getting a Zoom telephony connector server which gets sent a copy of the key. This doesn't sound particularly protected, right? Um, everybody kind of has the same shared key. So if you have this encryption key, you can get into these meetings. Um, the end to end would, would make it a little bit more difficult to do that. So, I mean, think about it. If the FBI gets that, how many Zoom meetings can they just spy on? How many Zoom meetings can they just, you know, if they have the back end, because this thing isn't isn't end-to-end -end encrypted, isn't encrypted tighter than what it is, tighter than just a regular website, if you're having a Zoom meeting, do you really want the FBI to spy on you? Do you really want the NSA to do that? That's crazy. And the corporation shouldn't do that. And they shouldn't have lied about it to begin with. That's what they did. They lied about this. So, you know, um, Right now, use a password to protect it. Zoom has come out to make a statement saying that they're going to, uh, they're going to like change their infrastructure, and I think there's they're they're going to release stuff publicly in like three months. Seems like a long time. We might not even be using Zoom at that point. We might be uh, doing something uh, uh, called meeting in the real world. We might be back to you know being present with each other in the real world in three months. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, I think that they need to release their, the way that their shit works uh, and, and be more public with, with their encryption uh, methodology. And, and there has to be some kind of accountability for their encryption methodologies as well. Like, they can't just say we have end-to-end -end, uh, and there's no... Yeah, why wasn't there anybody fucking checking in on this? Um, seems seems a little irresponsible in my opinion. <clears throat> I'm not particularly a fan of that. Uh, but for now, like I said, I'm I'm planning on doing this comedy show, um, trying to figure out and work out these details, trying to trying to learn this new software. Um, I probably will do Zoom, but I am also looking into some alternatives. So if there are some some folks that know about some alternatives, 
um, that uh, use alternatives. If you guys do online meetings and you're like, hey, you know, the Zoom thing had a, these XYZ bugs and glitches that I wasn't really able to work around and didn't particularly care for, um, then, you know, leave a comment, leave a link or something, you know, uh, because I think people are people are looking for these alternatives. People, you know, we, we shouldn't just go into a, the monopoly that all of these meetings need to be happening just through one platform, right? We should be looking at other platforms that might be better, that might be more ethical, that might be more secure than Zoom, um, and and not just give everything into into this one thing. Uh, so, but for the meantime, if you are using Zoom, if you are a teacher, or if you are somebody that that de you know depends on Zoom to to do your meetings and things of that sort, uh, please, 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 password protect. Use those passwords and don't make the password password. Okay, e even if you say PA55, it's not good. That's not great. People will figure that shit out. All right, use use something different something from your life you know like d cheese grater ball sack 28 don't use that that one's gone now that was gone now but you be creative with it be creative with it <clears throat> all right you might not want to use cheese grater ball sack 25 if you are like don't or of of the like if you're like a teacher uh don't do that that's a that's a bad that's a bad protocol uh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm not saying if you're a teacher, you should use any sort of, that's just as bad as zoom bombing. All right, we're moving on. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is our third and final story. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably going to get real fucking fired up about this one. Um, we're wasting food during this pandemic right now. We're wasting food during a fucking pandemic when there are people that don't have work that are concerned about when that savings is going to run out that are concerned about uh when you know everything is just going to stop when there isn't going to be any sort of payments coming in you know when if this thing goes on for another two fucking months how are people going to pay their rent and afford food there are people worried about this sort of shit and we are wasting food doing it. The Wisconsin dairy farmers right now are dumping tens of thousands of gallons of milk. Why? To save the milk market. To save the milk market. It's literally what it is, too. Um, the, the executive director of the cheese conglomerate, I can't remember exactly what it is, but he's some executive. He's some fucking suit that sits in an office probably eating cheeses that we've never fucking heard of as plebes uh, said that it's to save the milk market, which is fucking ridiculous because even pre-pandemic, even before all this stuff, there were hundreds and thousands of people starving that needed food, that go to bed hungry. Um, and we weren't doing enough to help them out, which is fucking insane now there's a lot more unemployed people right like there i think we're at like six million people that are applying for unemployment or something like that it like the number just escalated pretty incredibly um and a lot more families that are going to be struggling and what did these fucking dairy executives think of their profit margin their bottom line before people, before families that could use that fucking food. Are you insane? What kind of sociopath sits there and goes, I'd rather waste it uh, than like donate it to like someone that fucking needs it, okay? That, that, and that's the argument that they're making. That they can't they can't give it away they can't donate it to like a food shelter or whatever like they can't they, they just can't do that because uh well the profit margins would go down the, the the market shares would go down our stock prices would would decrease you know that um the the intern that i have to come in to tickle my balls well i would have to let that person go and you know is that what you want 
you want job loss, even higher job loss in this country, you know, I mean, I don't pay the intern. Um, that's just part of the, the job description that I put on Indeed.com. Well, I had to take it down from Indeed.com, so I had to circumvent it uh, to, to, to say, you know, to testicular favors to, to, make it, um, to make it more palatable to people. Uh, and everybody had a lot of questions, but only, but only Kyle stepped up. Okay, do you want Kyle to be out of a job? Because you wanted some families to be fed. Are you thinking about Kyle? Sure, I don't pay Kyle, and Kyle's not getting fed. But if you're not thinking about Kyle, they would rather pour gallons of milk, tens of thousands of gallons of milk, down the drain. And I watched this video, and even the dairy farmers are like, I don't really want to fucking do this. Like, I would rather see my hard work go to to do something to like mean something you know like i would rather it go to a hung but i mean i guess if the fucking dairy conglomerate says that we got to do this we got to do this no you fucking don't <laughs> you don't have to do this <laughs> the idea <clears throat> The idea that this, the, the, the executives, this, this suit somewhere in some fucking ivory tower that's probably never even stepped on a dairy farm before, that probably doesn't even know what cows look like, you know? To, to him, the cow is just a giant udder, um, and that's it. It's just the, 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 when, when he draws a picture of cows, he just draws an udder and then, uh, uh, and then dollar signs coming out of it. Like, that's what they understand to be. Um, they they basically said, well, maybe the government will step in and give us money so that we can donate it to feeding programs. Or you could just fucking do it because that's the right thing to do, you fucking sociopaths. You could just give it to to mutual aid groups, to fucking grocery stores that are that that everybody is going nuts. Right? Like, all these grocers, are, they're going fucking crazy, and they're probably taking food and milk and shit off the shelves. And once you donate it, keep track of what you donate. I'm sure you have a system of doing that. That's how you fucking keep up with, with what your markets are worth anyway. That fucking fake bullshit that you preach. This is real milk. You're pouring real milk down the drain to keep a fake economy running. Right now, Netherlands has too many fucking potatoes, um, and uh, and that's kind of the same problem, right? These restaurants, um, they're just not buying because they don't have the same level of uh, sales that are going through these restaurants. And um, the Netherlands are, they have this surplus of potatoes. They have this huge surplus of potatoes. And uh, you know what they're not doing with their potatoes? Uh, it's just setting it on fire. They're not just burning down shacks of potatoes in the Netherlands. They are trying to sell it. I think the dude said, like, he's selling it for um, essentially, like, what would what would be a penny instead of 18 cents uh, per kilogram or something like that. So he's reducing the rate significantly, but he's like, I will at least make something. And, you know, then somebody else can buy it, too, and they got food for their family. Maybe they can help somebody else. I don't know, you know, like they're not giving it away. <clears throat> so even if you look at this and you go, maybe some of these feeding programs in America have a little bit of cash. So if I'm selling the milk at four bucks a gallon, maybe I drop that down to about a buck, a dollar a gallon, then the farmers still get something. And how about this? Maybe the executive doesn't have to fucking take a cut if you really care about the farmers that much, right? It's like, oh, well, the, the markets will crash, and then what do they, I mean, these farmers are going to be out of work, and that's crazy. Well, if you give a shit about these farmers, if you give a shit about the American people, if you give a shit about families that can't feed themselves in a month, then maybe sell it for a buck instead of four, right? And maybe you don't fucking take a cut of it. Dude, there are record labels doing that right now. Not big ones, smaller ones. They're giving most of their profits back to the artist. You think, and like, you're telling me a small business can afford to take a little bit less so that somebody can survive a little bit longer 
and you're telling me that an executive that probably makes billions of dollars can't fucking give up one month, one fucking month of pay to make sure that the farmers are taken care of and some fucking hungry people are taken care of. <clears throat> that's fucking sociopathic. And that's what, they're, that's what they're protecting. They're protecting their wealth. They're protecting their income and not giving a shit about it. And, and it's like, even if they lose one month's worth of income, if any of these, if, if, if this dairy executive loses one month worth of income, they're going to be fine. They're going to be fine. They're 100% going to be fine. You know who's not? That farmer that has to throw this fucking milk away, man. That's crazy. This is incredibly short-sighted. Incredibly short-sighted. Because you could just have this stuff in reserve. You could just have this stuff in stock, right? Like, put it into a freezer. Um, put it into a freezer and, and you know, maintain it. Um, and then when there's a shortage, because there probably will be a shortage, uh, you, can, you have now something to give back to the community. And, and it would make you look like a, not like a fucking cartoon villain. Pittsburgh's food bank, where I'm from, is strained, is, is, is a report that I saw. Uh, that they're doing okay, but they are, the, I mean, this is higher demand than they've ever seen before. Um, so, you know, eventually there's going to be less donations. There's going to be less government, you know, government programs purchasing food for these, for, for these suppliers. Um, and here's the thing, the, these food banks depend on us to donate to them. Why aren't these corporations making any donations? <clears throat> I mean, isn't is, um, that that would make more sense, wouldn't it? Because they don't care about people; they care about that market. That market, oh, the stock prices. You know that fake shit we invent, and we put a bell to it, and we ring a bell. So that, uh, so that it lets the, the dragon of the market know that it needs to rise. Um, and then when we hit the bell a second time, it tells the dragon of the market that it can go underground and collect all those market shares and add it to the other market shares and bonds that are in that underground cave. Um, you know, you know that one? Yeah, and then, uh, and, then, and then the bull has to come out to make sure that the dragon just doesn't come out and just spread that market share everywhere. The bull is there to protect wall street and the market and because if that happens then you know the, i mean the whole the earth could shatter because the core i don't know if you guys know this but the core of the planet is actually made up of molten market shares that that the dragon will then pull out if you want to like buy you know like if you want to like sell your shares or whatever <clears throat> it pulls it out and unmoltens it um and only the dragon can know exactly how that works that's why they need the bell that's what these assholes care about some fake bullshit that they made up. And what we really need, what we really need going forward, uh, I think we need a program that uh, manages and penalizes food waste, that makes these fucking assholes accountable for wasting as much of food as they do, and, and holds us accountable for it too, because, because the consumer end of things is also a major problem. About, I want to say almost two years ago now, I did a video... Uh, specifically talking about food waste and organic food, why the cost of organic food is so high. Um, go check that out if you can. I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to find the links to that and drop it in the comments of this video. Um, uh, but, but if you have time, check those videos out because it really goes in-depth into this food waste problem that we have. Um, but 40% of our food goes to waste globally. For almost half, almost half. That's crazy pants. That's fucking crazy pants to me. Um, that 40% of food that can go to waste, could, like that alone could probably feed every hungry person in, in the world. That's crazy that we're not taking care of our food better. We shouldn't be putting profits in front of food. This is why we need them general strikes. If that farmer would have just said fucking no, you come down and do it. Mr. Cheese, cheese man, Mr. Dairy, Mr. Dairy executive man. We're done. You milk these cows. See how, see how, see how you like that shit. 
if I milk these cows, I'm going directly down to the school in, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, and fucking handing out milk to the kids that fucking need it. We need farmers to fucking do that right now. To go against these fucking dairy executives that don't care about the farmer, that don't care about the people, because the farmer's not going to get shit out of this deal anyway. They're not. If you think that the farmer's going to get taken care of, fuck no. It's these executives. It's these agriculture executives. It's these dairy executives. They're the ones that are going to get the bailouts. So fuck them. At this point, if if they're worried about their market, then fuck their market. Help out your neighbors. Help out the people that actually need this shit. Actually need the food. Stop wasting it. Oh, I told you that was going to get heated. (laughs) Oh, man. All right, guys. Uh, That is the video for today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, If you guys enjoyed this video, uh, I hope you guys left some comments. I hope you guys are leaving comments. Even if you don't leave the comments during the premiere of the video itself, if you catch this video later... um, Leave a comment. I'll be there to talk to you guys. I'll, I'll respond to it. I, I do my best to try to respond to everybody's comments, uh, and to, to what everybody is saying. Um, so please do. Um, a, the, the more interactive this thing gets, I think the more the more fun it is for everybody. I don't know. Uh, and if you guys are just listening, because that's because uh, because because I'm getting I'm getting all heated up, and you're just like, oh man, I don't know how to fucking handle. I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> Some of this stuff just works me up, but I feel like I gotta share it out there. I gotta let people know about it, right? Like it's crazy that we're that we're doing this stuff. Uh, but I hope you guys are taking care of yourselves. That's the important part. Make sure that you guys are are taking care of yourselves, uh, being being good to yourselves and each other. Um, this is the time I think you should be forgiving to yourself. So if you're if you're a little stressed out and you're not being as productive as you as you uh, thought you could be, or or so on and so forth, that's okay. Um, that's okay. Now is the time for, for us to kind of, you know, decompress. Maybe it now now might be the time for us to just chill out for a little bit, um, take a take a break, take an extended break if needed. Um, I know I know there are days that I feel like I need that. I know there you know like like last night I just hung out and watched uh, Pierre Vachon's show for about an hour before I went to bed, and I watched an episode of Star Trek before I I you know eventually passed out, and and that was. That was nice. It was fun. I, I like that. Um, and, you know, it, it, that that's not something that you need to feel guilty about. Um, you know, be good to yourself. Uh, but uh, a way that you can help this show grow and, and get better and um, and so on and so forth is uh, one, sharing. Um, hit that share button. Uh, share it to groups. Share it to your profiles, your pages, your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would would enjoy um, enjoy content like this. Enjoy listening to something that you're not going to hear about in 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 corporate media. You're just not. You're, the corporate media isn't going to talk about general strikes. They're not going to talk about you know putting people in front of the market or or these these food shortages that we're gonna we're gonna see or any of this sort of stuff. So this is this is really alternative stuff. Um, we have to we have to be the the people that write uh the the accurate version of history um so you know share it out to some folks hit that like button um and if you can by no means is this mandatory if you have the ability to if you have the means to uh you can donate to become a sustaining member or make a one time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate uh to all the people that already have become sustaining members and made a a donation i really appreciate it thank you guys so much you guys are fucking amazing uh to all the people that continue watching this show continue supporting this thing thank you guys so much i love you guys take care of yourselves we'll see you tomorrow see you on the road